All right, as we continue on, one thing to tell you real quick that's totally unrelated to this. This morning, I, I don't know if he was on the warpath. I don't know what was going on. But this morning at about 11 o'clock, Mr. Corrigan came into my other classroom and was very upset. Okay. Walked up to one guy, and basically he said he had, even though they were tan colored, he said they were blue jeans. All right. Then he looked at me right away, so I knew he was mad at me for not saying that, but I couldn't tell. Then he walked up to uh, Tony, who's one of the best students in the class, and he said, you don't have a belt on, and you didn't have one on yesterday. I should kick you out right now and make you go home. I didn't like that, but it's his right as the department head. Okay. Then there were two guys in the class, and to be fair, you know, in, in that room, though, it's still really weird temperature-wise, the, the, and the, the fan was blowing pretty hard today, that they had their coats on and they weren't ranking coats. So I, I kind of whispered to both of them as he was walking around, take the non-ranking coats off. So they're struggling, and they got them off. But then they were talking to me afterwards, and they were like, that's so cold, and it's just... Remember, if you do want to buy anything, and I'm not trying to sell you anything, but if you do, just go over to the other building and talk to Jeremy, all right? In the worst case scenario, he's going to start coming in here too. I don't walk in and go, gee, does Valerie have a belt on today? I don't do that, all right? Uh, but I'm supposed to, from what I understand, all right? And because they, they, what they say is if you don't have everything on, you're out of compliance, and in the worst case, what I've been told is I'll have to line every one of you up every day and spend the first five to ten minutes having you twirl for me and make sure that everything that you've got is correct. And technically, if it's not, I'm supposed to send you home. Now, I'm not going to do that. But there's nothing to stop him from starting to come in here and doing that. And I, I don't, look, just taking a very quick look, I don't see anyone who's out of compliance. But just try, please, to make sure that you're not. I ended the last five minutes of class yesterday with that. And there's another thing. One of my, one of my first-year students, I'm not even going to say who the student is. They're all guys, so I can say one of the guys was a first-year student. It's 11.49, so it's six minutes before the end of class. He always puts on his hat and his coat, and he just stands there like this for six minutes. If Charles sees that, he's going to have a bird. It's not the right word, but you can get the idea. He won't be pleased. When he's not pleased, he calls me into the office, and he asks me why I put up with that. Well, it's not like the person's causing any trouble. It's kind of the opposite. All right? And I know some of you are very much in a hurry to get out of here at 425. And I can, honestly, I can understand that. I will tell, I will tell you, I get here every morning at quarter to six. So whether you think so or not, I'm in more of a hurry to get out of here than any of you are. All right? All right, let's finish the chapter up. So they start talking about here on how to handle high-level events. Remember, high-level events are basically, they start here with checkboxes and radio buttons. All right? So it says how to handle the check changed event. Now think about this. Back in the olden days, like about five years ago, all right, it used to be that what you'd see, and you may remember this, that if you brought up a, like a print page for Word or something, you'd see three boxes, and they would look like this. You know, for bolding, italicizing, and underlining, they don't do it like that anymore. The point is, those are check boxes, right? They're non-mutually exclusive events. You can have any one checked, any two checked, any three checked, or none of them checked. The reason I'm bringing that up is you should by now know what a checkbox is, and you should by now, by now know the difference between a checkbox and a radio button. The biggest difference is checkboxes are set up for non-mutually exclusive events. Radio buttons are set up for mutually exclusive events. All right? So they show some examples in here. And they mention that probably this is the, what you're, the way that you're going to want to do this. What does this mean? This is the event that fires when this was either checked and you uncheck it, or it was unchecked and you check it. It's the uncheck change event. All right? 
So as it says in here, what are we doing? Well, notice, remember the tip percent or don't remember it. All right. So we are doing something programmatic based on what's happening in here. That's I don't know any other way to put it other than that. So again, take a look at the bottom of each one of the pages where they have this description section that's in here. So those of you who are struggling, I'd say that's a great place to start. Look at the code example. Then underneath it, where it says description, read that. Don't memorize it, but read it and see if it makes sense to you. All right, then you've got radio groups. Notice it says a radio group class is wired to a radio group. So in other words, it's a bunch of radio buttons that belong together. So typically you set up a radio group and then you shove radio buttons into the radio group. All right. So again, in this example, what are we doing? We're telling you that, what do you, do you want to do rounding? All right. Now, with this too, probably the way that you're going to do this is you're probably going to end up rounding up. I know I think at least one of you in here is either a waiter or a waitress or has been in the past. All right. It's a good thing if your person rounds up. All right. So if I have something delivered to me, and let's say that it's, I don't know, $18.88, and I give 20% tip. All right. Well, I can just say, well, let's see, for 20 bucks, it would be $360, so I'll give them a $4 tip. All right. That's much better than rounding down. You know, you're going to make more money that way. But, you know, you've got your choice when you set this up over are you rounding, how are you rounding, etc. Right. So as it says, what we're using here is on check changed. And what we used before was on check changed. Because list, or I'm sorry, check boxes and radio buttons in many ways are very similar. We learned this not now. We learned this back in the days of HTML, where there was a lot of stuff in common between them. All right. Then they go on for spinners. All right. Again, a spinner is what we would call a drop-down list. Notice now that it's not on check changed. It's on item selected. All right. So based on which of these you choose, you're going to be able to set it up accordingly. All right? There's not a lot of code in here. Well, typically with an, with an adapter, it's something that you're able to add to as the program's running. Right. There might be a better explanation of what I just gave you. Well... It, it's like if you've got a drop-down list, you want to give the user the ability to add things to it while the program is running. All right. So the author does talk a little bit about it here. The first parameter provides the adapter view object. Okay, well, that's not a very... Uh, potentially. How's that? All right. The next, we've got the seek bar. So notice with the seek bar, as you move along, it's an on progress changed. That can be changed in a positive direction. That can be changed in a negative direction. So what they do in this example here is they go back to the tip calculator and they redo it all right, so that you're able to use a seek bar. And again, they mention that the seek bar, typically it's what you're going to use your thumb for to move something from the left to right or right to left. So notice what we have here. We've got different methods. On progress changed, I already mentioned to you. There is an on start tracking touch. As it says, when you begin to change the value of the seek bar, there is an on stop. Okay. So when you're doing this, there's you're in one of three modes. You're just about to start, you're moving it, you stop moving it. That's what they're talking about. 
right? And you can potentially put code in any of these. All right. What's left then are the low-level events. And remember, low-level events correspond to any control that you have. So any possible widget can respond to these. All right. So it says many Android devices are touchscreens that can interact by touching the screen. Many other Android devices contain hardware components, especially if you've got older ones. All right. I don't understand a lot of things in life, one of the things, even after almost 38 years, I don't understand is my wife. I got her a brand new um, Amazon Fire tablet, but she insists on using her almost 10-year-old iPad. Why? Because it's easier. And then we go over, because I bought one for her, and then for Christmas bought one for my mother. All right, We go over to my mom, and she's showing my mom how to use it. But yet she won't use hers. I don't get that. All right. But she has a keyboard on hers that, that's always there. The one that's on the one for my mother, you could bring it up, but it's not always there. But the one that, that we've got for my mom and that she's got one, it's almost totally touch. Almost everything you do, you can get in, get in you can get out, you can do make a lot of changes by just swiping. All right. So the bottom line is, the newer the component, the better the chance that your user is going to be interfacing with your program using touch events than it is they're going to be using keyboard events or key events. All right? It's funny they mention stuff like a keyboard, a D-pad, a trackball. You don't see that many trackballs around anymore. All right? I'm not saying you never do, but I don't think you see nearly as many as you used to. So when you work with key events, all right, here's some of the stuff that you can work with. Again, notice this is on a hard keyboard. It is possible, you already all know this, that it is possible that if I'm sitting there running this, all right, so if I go back, I'm not going to start it again, but if I run this program, okay, if I click inside of right here, it's going to bring up the soft keyboard, right? But if it's already there, I can use the hard keyboard. It's, it's recommended that you never do that because, again, a lot of devices aren't going to have any kind of keyboard. All right? Built in. They'll have like a, one, one of these, like the soft one that comes up. So I don't want to read to you, but, again, you can see that. When does a touch event occur? When you touch. All right, that should make sense. As it says, sometimes you might need to handle a touch event. You might want to set a game up where little, or even better than that. Let, let's assume that, that Amin for his app wants to do a painting app. And he wants to set it up so that everything that you do, every time you move your finger back and forth and you start swiping, you're going to be painting. That would make sense. All right, and then maybe if you go, you know, in a certain other direction or something else, you can change colors or do whatever. Then you have to make sure that you handle each one of those touch events, and that's exactly what they're talking about in here. The program is only as smart as the person who's written it. Does that make sense? All right. So if you say, "Well, this would be really cool," and you plan on doing ten things in your app, but you get to the third one and it's so darn hard, you only get three things done. Okay, that's all the app can do then are those three things. All right? You know, it's funny, I, I said that once, maybe I've even told you this, but I remember saying that once. I said, you know, a program is only as good as the person who writes it. And I had a person in the class who got offended. I said, you, said, you said I'm stupid. I, said, I don't understand, how did I say you're stupid? Well, my program sucks, so you must think I'm stupid. No, you just announced to the class, though, that your program sucks. All right, which it didn't anyway. So again, some of the constants, some of the stuff that you can use in here. Then they, they end the chapter by going back to the tip calculator app, or as they call it, the new and improved tip calculator app. Now, you can draw your own conclusions as to whether or not this particular example is better than the last one. 
All right. You'll notice that for the percentage now, you're using a seek bar as an example. All right. Now, I think personally they could have written this in other ways to make it better. Like what? Well, I wouldn't have had the rounding thing like they've got here. I wouldn't have done that. Instead, I would have had a, a, an example here where you could have you would have had like a radio button that would have said, do you want to do the tip manually where you would show the two buttons or you want to do it with a seek bar? So you could have done it like that. So there's a lot of different ways that this particular example could be done. And they give you the code that goes along with that as well. Notice the more junk that you put in here, the more import statements you're going to have. And when you put in these import statements, you're going to start putting in the listeners also. All right. And you, will, you already know this because we talked about it with Java. All of these that, where it says impl implements, this listener, this listener, those are all interfaces. You implement interfaces. When it says extends, that's inheritance. When it says implements, these are all interfaces. You can implement as many interfaces in Java as you want to or need to. Zero dot 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 kind of thing. You can only have one class that you extend. So it's either zero or one. And they just explain all right all the code that's in there. And again, if you're struggling in here, I already mentioned, I would be looking at the right hand side of the page, reading those descriptions. I would also recommend reading the summary at the end of every chapter. But you're reading this stuff not to memorize it. You're reading it so you have some kind of understanding of what it's about. I think that rather than going into chapter 7, we'll do that tomorrow. All right? So we've now gone through chapters 5 and 6. If you get the chance, please try to go through and look at at least chapter 7. And if you get the time, go into chapter 8, which, is our, which are on menus and preferences. And if you're still looking for more to do, going to chapter 9, which is on fragments. We will not probably get done with all three chapters tomorrow. All right? But what I'm thinking of doing, for tomorrow at least, is going over chapter 7, and then having us do, I don't think we're going to do yet the uh, um, rock, paper, scissors, but I want to give you some kind of an exercise that will kind of tie together all the stuff we've gone over in chapters 5 and 6, and seven. All right, we'll do that, and then we'll see where we are at the end of that. Okay. All right. Looking around, I think you can all amuse yourselves for the next hour and twenty minutes. Do I want what? Their updated test? No. I will do my best to have your test graded. By tomorrow. I should be able to do that because my morning class has got a lab for the entire period. So I should be able to get that done. And a couple other things I want to do, but I, like I said, I should be able to get that done. 